I was a child, I was told I could be anything, that I could be president, that I could change the world. When I got into the real world, I realized that some of my sort of girly qualities weren't as prized as some other people's boy qualities. And I spent a lot of time thinking about my appearance or thoughts on personal safety and a certain element of frustration um, related to treatment or issues of being a woman. And then I became a mom. Now, I have a five-year-old boy and a six-year-old girl, and they are the most in intelligent, perfect, fabulous, extraordinary, inspiring, creative little creatures on the planet. Of course, that's a fact. Um, I'm not saying it's all easy, uh, but and sometimes I actually think that phrase should be adjusted to say that the years go by so quickly, but days can sure seem interminable. <laughs> However, I really wanted these children very, very much, and they have changed my life, and I, my heart sort of bursts with joy regularly because they're in it. So I noticed immediately, though, from birth, how they were quickly um, divided into two distinct gendered camps. How when I brought my newborn in a green onesie to the dentist, um, to my dentist, he admired what a big strapping boy he was and how he could be a future Buckeye. And when I finally said, oh, actually, that's a girl, he immediately switched to say how delicate her features were and what a beautiful little princess she was. <laughs> now, I like pink, and I like ruffles and lace, and so I dressed her in those things, and along with um, green and yellow and a wonderful slate gray outfit that my sister had handed me down from someone in Europe. I also noticed then, though, how with my son, my own reactions were different. How when he has to have a clip in his hair, like his sister, to match her, I sort of steered him away from it. Or when at Stride Right, he was three years old, and we went to buy shoes, and he came up to me, and he's holding these pink, jewel-encrusted, bling-bling, Dorothy, we are definitely not in Kansas anymore, shoes, and said, Mama, aren't they beautiful? I said, oh, yeah, honey, those are really beautiful shoes. Um, they're too big for you. And I led him over to the section of boys' shoes, which were seven shades of brown. If my daughter could have provided the soundtrack at that moment, she would have loved it, because it kind of sounded like wah, wah, wah. <laughs> and I realized something right in that moment, that there's this binary division that we give our children from the moment of birth. And even as babies, we are telling them things that they can and can't do in ways they can and can't be. I mean, I was raised free to be you and me, but then, there's a complexity in it because I, for instance, allowed my son to hit things with a stick, say more than I kind of felt a gut socialized reaction to let my daughter do that. And that, though, is complicated because I have to raise them to be in our society, which expects them to act a certain way as a girl and a boy and then as a woman and a man. I have to parent them to be in our culture. Well, in between sort of juggling work with school schedules and making lunches and trying to find the darn library books and sort of negotiating with my husband about who was going to do the children's brushing of teeth that night, my husband and I actually went out to a date night. All right, I want you all to close your eyes for a moment. Everybody, you in the back, you too. And I want you to imagine this. Red sequin dress, brown hair swept into an up-to, impeccable makeup, if I do say so myself. Um, and I'll pick out a couple adjectives, seductive and sultry. And then next to that, I want you to imagine a crisp white jacket, black shirt, um, aviator sunglasses, and fedora hat. Pectorals puffed up, sleek and confident. Now open your eyes. Is this what you were imagining? <laughs> so my husband's in my date night, it was a drag show. Um, it was all new to us, and it was definitely not what we expected. But I'll tell you, if you haven't gone to a drag show in Columbus, you should definitely get tickets. It is a remarkable explosion of creativity on stage and a wonderful way to spend an evening. So two and a half years ago, I decided to make a documentary film about drag kings, and drag queens, and transgender performers here in Columbus, Ohio. I um, will give you a few insights into Columbus drag culture. Now, no one can speak to everything, and it's a... Uh, you know, imagine this as my personal opinion and a snapshot in a moment in time. Columbus serves as a kind of beacon for the LGBTQ community in Ohio in that it's a 
good-sized city with multiple universities and colleges. It has corporations with progressive benefit packages. And so generally, you can walk down High Street without fear holding your partner's hand, without fear of someone intolerant saying something or attacking you. As a drag king Topher Wright put it, it's a wonderful gay bubble. It is small, but it's here, it's queer, and we're already used to it. <laughs> Columbus has kind of a unique uh, culture and style of drag. It's a collaborative culture where multiple performers come together on stage doing group numbers. It also is, um, you could say there are arguably competitive performers who come together regularly to put on shows. Uh, this leads to thousands of dollars being raised for charities and fundraisers every single year by these performers coming together. One could say that the more professional a drag performer is, the less time they spend in drag. And what I mean by this is that drag is a job. Like anyone's uniform, once the job's over, the uniform comes off. So these performers show up at a dressing room looking like you or me. They transform themselves into a creative persona. And once the show's over, off comes the duct tape, the makeup, the wig, and they go home. Drag is essentially a full-time job for many of these people, and yet it's very hard to make a living. So only one performer can make a li is able to make a living full-time doing drag. The others are retail workers, academics, bankers, salespeople, and so forth. It can cost up to $5,000 to put on a large show from the performer's own money. They have handmade puppetry, original videos, lighting design, um, multiple group choreographed numbers, it's weeks and months of rehearsal. The truth is it really is a labor of love and an art form. Drag is anything but sexual. This is something often people get mixed up. The truth is these performers are in layers of duct tape or binders, padding, pantyhose, wigs, facial hair. They have glue on their face. It is hot, it's uncomfortable, and every single one I've interviewed has said it is the farthest thing from a sexual experience, but rather it is an experience of gender, of politics, or of theatrical, um, sorry, theatrical performing. For every 50 different people you ask, you will get 50 different answers of what exactly drag is, what it means, and why they do it. I followed the Royal Renegades Drag King troupe here, and um, I've also interviewed the people from the West family. And so uh, each of these troops includes the following categories. There are drag queens, who are men who dress up as women. There are drag kings, who are women who dress up as men. There are boy dancers, who are men who perform heightened masculinity. There are femmes, who are women who perform heightened femininity on stage. And there are transgender performers. And the interesting thing about this group is that they're not always necessarily performing drag. Some of them are just doing theater. The Royal Renegades also include genderqueer performers and burlesque. Now, drag can be really funny, whether it be the um, Rudolph special replete with heat miser and snow miser, or the parody on the movie Saw dancing to the song Foot Loose. Um, <laughs> It can, be, it can sort of push you out of your comfort zone, or it can be a place of complete acceptance. It can be two hours of just sheer entertainment, or a way to sing your favorite pop tune really, really loudly with your friends. Through it all, whether or not it's even the performer's intention, drag turns gender on its head, because it makes us think and question what we thought we knew. So why does gender matter, really? Well, I can give you a small example. I took my kids to buy Legos, and the man in the store explained that Legos has a line specifically for girls. These figurines do not fit in with any other Lego sets. They are um, in a color palette that is predominantly pink and purple. The sets focus on horse farms, beauty salons, cooking, that sort of thing, and the figures themselves are female. They, um, their legs don't move. They uh, have breasts, and they are skinny. Now, I uh, actually hadn't even noticed that regular Lego sets do have um, only an occasional female until my nephew asked his sister, my sister, his mother, um, how Legos procreate when they're all men. <laughs> my daughter, actually, in that Lego store, after the man's explanation, felt really uncomfortable, and she felt like we were breaking the rules because we were not shopping in the girls' section. See, we can say that it's all in fun, or we just think these are toys, but actually kids really pick up on these things, and it does matter. Dozens of studies have been done um, showing the, how um, in, increased media exposure and marketing actually influence stereotypes that children hold about occupations and individuals. 
there is great research being done now by Dr. Stacy Smith at the USC Annenberg School and at the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media. Additionally, meta-analysis um, done by scholars at the University of Wisconsin and the University of Michigan have correlated that an increased media exposure um, relates, for instance, negatively to satisfaction with women's bodies. So back to the shopping mall, be it computer apps that we buy, clothing, or toys. In essence, what we're doing is we're segregating our children. We're saying boys on this side, girls on that side. Or maybe boys in that section of the store and girls shop in that section. If this were any other type of segregation, would we allow it so freely ourselves and enforce it so willingly? The problem with it is it's based on a binary model. You are one thing or you are another. You are a boy or you are a girl. You are masculine or you are feminine. You are heterosexual or you are homosexual. The truth is these things are a lot more complicated. So let's start look at the look at those three elements of human personalities. The first would be boy girl, that's your biological sex. The second is um, sexuality, which would be homosexual, heterosexual. And the third is masculine, feminine, that's your gender. So let's take the first one. That's your biological sex. Now this is really easy, right? You're a boy or you're a girl. Actually, it's a lot more complicated. We all know that there are intersex people, for instance, who are born with unclear or both sets of genitalia. And there are transgender people whose um, inner self-image does not match their physicality. Additionally, there are people who are born as a boy or a girl, but then their hormones respond differently to estrogen and testosterone, and that actually can impact their biological sex identity. For most of us here, we generally can fall into one camp or another and survive socially. But for those who can't, they either transition to the other sex, or they um, commit suicide, or they transcend, meaning they'll live as neither or both. So we can see that there is somewhat of a spectrum on this. Sexuality, okay, you're, you might be straight E. McStraderson, or you might be 100% homosexual, or you might be heterosexual and every so often feel attracted to someone of your own sex. Sexuality is very complicated because it's an interplay of pheromones, um, physicality, personal experience, culture, hormone reception, and all these things. And so you can kind of understand there's a fluidity in this. The third category is gender expression. Now that's how you dress, how you do your hair, uh, how you present yourself to the world. So generally it's masculine or feminine. And we all can relate to this because we all know people who are cowboys or women who love shoe shopping and getting manicures or rugby playing women or men who care a lot about their clothing and hair. This is a continuum that's in real shift because um, as people's behavior changes, so does our image of what these things mean. So for instance, men being more hands-on and parenting or emotionally dem demonstrative changes what we imagine as masculinity. At the same time, this is something that's becoming dangerously more extreme in its division in marketing and media and its sexualization at earlier and earlier ages for children. Your gender expression does not determine your sexuality. And this is something that's often conflated. For instance, if a boy likes ball is interested in doing ballet, he might be bullied as gay. Or if a girl is athletic or aggressive, some people might say she's a lesbian. Well, that's totally not true. And I'm sure we all know examples where that isn't true. And so the truth is that doesn't have one thing to do with another. And likewise, your sexuality does not determine your gender expression. A similar note to this is that on forms you will often see gender as a substitute for the biological sex. These things have nothing to do with each other and that's just simply a mistaken idea. So let's imagine these three things as parallel lines. They do not intersect. You intersect anywhere on those three lines. And I have to grab my form because this part's a little complicated. You can be a super masculine, totally attracted only to women, dude, a long curly haired, lipstick wearing lesbian female, say. A metrosexual, heterosexual male. A not super girly, not at all masculine, bisexual woman. A feminine, heterosexual, trans man. A butch, gay man. A sometimes suit wearing, sometimes dress wearing lesbian, trans woman. A cultured and sensitive gay man. Or is that guy just European? 
The point is, the possibilities are endless, as you can see here. Now, this has also been further developed by Sam Killerman with the gender-bred person figure, which divides it into four categories, separating out your biological sex identity that you know from the equipment you were born with. And that is separate, obviously, from the people that you are attracted to and the way that you express yourself in the world. All of us have elements that cross over sort of traditional gender role differentiation. The truth is gender isn't male or female. It's sort of like we're all cake mixes, and we're not made from a box. So some might have a little more flour, some a little more sugar, some might be vanilla bean, some might be chocolate. The possibilities are all there. Or you might end up looking like my son's birthday cake. <laughs> so the facts are there that the world is not black or white in this realm. And we need to allow it to be more complex. As we know, if only from the title of a best-selling book, there are many, many shades of gray. <laughs> I'm hoping that by my not assuming that every animal I now see in the world is a he, or by being mindful to offer my children an entire color palette of all the Y colors that are av available rather than just pink or blue, or perhaps my signing the petition at mightygirl.org to ask Toys R Us to stop categorizing its toys based on biological sex, but to start doing it on maybe something more useful like theme or use, that maybe by doing these tiny things that I will offer a world for myself and my children that has a richer sense of possibility. And I'll end with a story. A few weeks ago, my car was broken into. And I broke the news to my kids and said, this robber had rummaged through the cassette collection, our extensive children's book on cassette collection. I have an old car. And, uh, <laughs> and after that, he had taken my cup of plastic cup with pencils and their Chuck E. Cheese tokens and tickets they'd been saving up. And I was really worried that they'd feel sort of violated or like they couldn't leave things in the car anymore. But instead, my daughter's reaction surprised me. She said, Mom, how do you know the robber was a man? Now, no parent knows what they're doing, and every day is an invention, just as it is in life. No one is in complete control. But in that moment, I thought, wow, we all can change the world. Thank you.